They don't deserve you. Hello, welcome to Art Lawish, ownership of a Banksy and copyright laundering. This is a special episode dedicated to Dr. Graham Shaw, who was a gifted lecturer to say the least, a friend, and one of the reasons and key driving forces of why I went into the bar. And some words about him are discussed or said after this video. Banksy, well, we know who he is and what he does, specifically using spray paint and stencils to produce witty images that often involve a social or political commentary about the community displaced within. So how does the law interact with the Banksy, you might ask? Well, Banksy interacts with the law in many, many ways, which this video will discuss and the PDF link to this video will expand upon further. However, what specific laws does Banksy street art interact with? For the most part, it is copyright law for the image itself and land law for its physical ownership. One of the main interactions Banksy's art has with the law is obviously with copyright. Copyright is statute based and copyright is automatically given to an artwork when it is an original piece of work. This is enshrined in section 1 of the Copyright Design and Patent Act 1988. To save time, tongue twisting and outtakes are referred to the Copyright Design and Patent Act 1988 as the Act. The Act and the law wisely do not define art, as this is not the judge's or the law's position to comment on an object's artistic worth. Anyway, back to the point. Uh, the provision of Section 1, Subsection 1A offers copyright protection of an original artistic work, irrespective of, of artistic quality. Therefore, it is not a question of creation, but effort exhorted, exhorted in producing it. The threshold for originality of an artwork is low because all that matters in law is that the author created the work through his own skill, judgment and individual effort and has not copied from other works directly or mindlessly. Unlike originality, artistic artworks are more narrowly defined and that's stated in section 4, limiting what an artwork could have or what artworks could have copyright and specifically under section 4 subsection 2a of the act I would argue Banksy street art would be termed as painting, or as a painting. Now, let's go back to the narrow definition of a term. The term painting, despite being undefined in the act, is defined or given its definition by its natural meaning, or the courts have followed that. Therefore, it is open to contemporary artistic practices to alter its definition. The term painting was discussed in a case involving the copyright for Adam's aunt's makeup. Don't you ever, don't you Uh, which predated the act and the case is merchandising corporation of america incorporated and heartboard limited 1983 that limited the term painting to its ordinary meaning and would not and the courts would not stretch it to accommodate makeup or face paint into its definition to attract copyright also copyright and another point is a right over property and you can't have a right over physical parts of the body Banksy has copyright, yes, but for a small snag. Uh, public interest power allows the courts not to enforce a copyright if it activates section 171, subsection 3 of the Act. This touches Banksy's and other street artists' ability to enforce their copyright, which protects their potential commercial exploits. This is because the work is created through criminal damage, i.e. defacing a wall, and it is highly unlikely the court will enforce such a copyright because the court cannot and will not enforce or support or promote a copyright of a work that is derived or created through an illegal action or a wrong. In Hyde Park, uh, in Hyde Park Residence in Yelland, 2000 paragraphs 43 and 44, the court found such an illegal act or, or wrong or aspect of a wrong in a creation of an artwork or creation of a copyright can be described as a tainting which would allow the court the discretion not to enforce the right of its creators. However, copyright can still be gained from the original creation by laundering the copyright into another medium, i.e. by taking a photograph of it. The subject of the copyright of the image itself may be transplanted into another image by a photograph. This would allow Banksy and or his publishers to then profit from the new images copyright created by a skilled photographer, earning what I would suggest a secondary copyright. 
The English courts have stated that a photograph of a single, and this is important, three-dimensional static item have their own copyright. This low threshold of originality must be met to attract copyright protection. This was dissected by the court stating that the efforts involved in positioning the angle of the shot, lighting, focusing, the wanted image, were all matters of judgment, skill, and, well, judgment and skill in capturing an image, despite its basic value. And this was stated in um, antiquesportsfolio.com PLC and Rodney Fitch. So, as oh, uh, Rodney Fitch, therefore Banksy can have or can still maintain or rather have a copyright of his own work through a commission of a photograph. As most street artwork only exists because they're created on a wall or in other forms of street furniture, like a phone booth. This means the images are physically attached to and dependent on an object for its existence, becoming part of it, becoming a fixture of that property. Therefore, as the artwork exists on the surface of a wall, it is very difficult to annex it, as you are stripping a layer of paint or surface to achieve this. Therefore, structurally speaking, the street artwork is not a separate element of the wall, like a mural. Due to human opportunism, something like this has occurred, and such an image ended up in Florida. The plaster slash chunk of the wall was taken holding the layer of paint making the image. This was done without the consent of the property owner, obviously, and amounted to criminal damage amongst other things. The Banksy that was taken was called slave labour, which was sadly sold for £750,000. Despite its unusual or rather suspicious circumstances, how it came on the lot. This leads to another point. If a Banksy is kept and looked after, a benefit is derived from it. To preserve or own a work of a Banksy will add considerable value to the property it exists on, as much as Half a million could be added, could be added, as seen by a rundown or abandoned pub, which now holds as a, which now has a giant image of a rat, of a rat. This is a considerable good reason to keep a Banksy, even if you're not an admirer of his work. Can the other side claim ownership of what was discussed? I.e., can the landowner have ownership of any of the two copyrights, and can the artist have an interest in the landowner's property? In short, no to all of them, and this is and for the following reasons. The original image's copyright belongs to the artist unless the artist has assigned the copyright in writing to someone else. In other words, gave a piece of paper stating that they pass on the copyright of their own work to someone else, and that's section 90 of the Act. This would hardly or likely occur, therefore, the property owner has no claim over the primary copyright or the original copyright of the image. The secondary copyright belongs to anyone who takes a picture themselves, and like as, as I just stated in section 90, unless it has been assigned, the copyright does not move from anyone else, therefore the property owner has no claim. What about the physical ownership of the property and who it belongs to? Well, in short, again, belongs to the landowner. And when we consider, however, how much money has been added to the property, would that give any effect to it? Well, in short, again, no, because equity would not allow it, as there is no fiduciary relationship, like, for example, between a bank manager and their client, or a solicitor and their client, to govern any obligation between the parties for their financial interest. So the property is safe, but maybe not from illicit auctioneers in Florida. Some brief points on the criminal law and planning development aspects which interact with the Banksy. Well, when laundering Banksy's copyright into a sellable photograph, provisions in the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002 are activated because there's a criminal element to the creation of Banksy's art through criminal damage. The Act, in essence, penalises anyone who makes money from criminal conduct, and in this case, it would be Banksy or a street artist who would, from the selling of posters and books cataloguing their street art, which would, that, which would earn money from them, would be caught. As for planning and development law, or what I would call the Belgravia dilemma, local council powers in maintaining uniformity, this is an issue with those who exercise section 215 of the Town and Country Planning Act 1990, or better put, section 215 notice, to enforce the homeowner to amend the property to suit to its neighbouring property. So a property in Belgravia that has a Banksy, let's say worth £20,000, will be ordered to remove it as it would be seen detrimental to the amenity of the area, 
or its vibe. Um, I know what you're thinking. If you've seen a blank uh, white wall in Shoreditch, will the council order someone to spray paint some art on it? Well, no. But it is more likely that a piece of street art will exist there than in Belgravia. All this echoes a truth about art and society. Art is above reason and above the law. It is demonstrated by the fact that something which is considered as art, as opposed to graffiti, has value on the face of it, while both are forms of criminal damage. This is all because of the subjective title of an artist or talent. This same odd logic of escape or lessening of a punishment which the law should inflict appears in everyday society because it is circumvented by human appreciation of a talented individual or their exceptional skill. An example would be um, our celebrity culture and their lean sentences or form, forms of punishment as seen by the repercussions given to Jeremy Clarkson after punching an employee of the BBC. An artistic example would be how literally Charles V picks up um, Titian's paintbrush, you have authority bending towards the artist, or how you have Pushkin, who was stomached by the Russians' elites for, for, uh, from his comments and what he said and what he's done. Also, we have the same issue with Raphael, who ran rampant in Florence while the Vatican tolerated him because of his talents. This, in my opinion, is exemplified by Banksy with the law. He is an individual unmatched. So much so his work is allowed to exist and be protected with property owners desperately to have it. This to me is art law, nuanced, complicated and sociological. All is forgiven for a brilliant talent as they are above our society's convention and above our criminal provisions. Thank you. take um hopefully some humor will actually make me do this properly uh condolences to his family and to his sister most importantly and i don't know how they're feeling about it uh, considering how close family is and close friends are but i've been quite winded by it um he was one of the people that gave me an intellectual the intellectual confidence and bravery to be sometimes a cunt as some might describe it but also he allowed me to be myself and he gave or produced a form of art history that was rich and it was not this basic idea of oh time blah 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 no it was saturated with politics philosophy um, social upheaval context religion especially when you're looking at 21st century or 20th century art and conflict where he described to us the difficulties of Northern Ireland, which he lived in for a few years, and how the orange, uh, the orangemen, and the iconography of it was described. He also talked about, and I will never forget this, how memorials are dependent on living memory to exist. And a good example would be a 17th or 19th or 18th century, whatever, pompous moron on a horse riding into battle with badges dawned upon them were trying to kind of stamp in into physical space and social conscious conscious space that this was an epic battle and we should not forget it we should not forget the blood that was lost etc etc however we're not going to remember the remnants of the franco-prussian war or we're not going to care about it because these monuments need living memory to exist and a good example, which he stressed, was the cenotaph. The cenotaph has no cultural visual language to alter it or to set it up at a specific time and place. Instead, it is used as a surrogate to hold memorials and almost to hang memories upon those that died in the First World War, Second, Falklands, Gulf War One, Two, and Afghanistan, to say the least. That's what he taught us. 
but also it's a very mundane subject where he brought it to life but that's because he was passionate and he was a phenomenal public speaker which I've tried to emulate in so many ways but I, I still can't to this day and I don't know what to say I am going to miss him bitterly and I'm going to miss the fact that we go to a gallery we break it down to its most political points and then get absolutely pissed after and talk about Labour and how much we hate the fucking Tories. Um, also on that note, he gave me a confidence to be left, or to be leftist, especially going to a university when you're filled with private school kids. It's quite daunting. And also now in a profession filled with private school kids, it's quite daunting. But he taught me how to be me. And if I could ever pass that on to someone, and that being a small bit of cenotaph or one memorial, is that... Be intellectually brave, but also, and most importantly, show art history as the complete history, by where you accept it is biased, but it is complex, it is rich, and it is honest in that point, rather than general history, which tries to be as objective as possible, dates, times, and figures. I think that is what needs to be said. Anyway, I've gone on too long, and Graham, I'm going to miss you.